like the very, very first program was about the raft of the Medusa, and it was about this picture. Um, and uh, I haven't seen it for years, but I seem to remember that we had this device in it where I didn't actually speak to camera. I just looked at camera with my mouth shut and you heard my words. It was very, it was very existential. I wore a black polo neck um, and I was like, a, I was as thin as Jarvis Cocker. And um, yeah, it was, and I smoked all the time on camera, like continuously. I smoked like 500 Gaulois. Um, so that's probably why the BBC has <laughs> never repeated it because I'm sure you're not, you can't possibly have a presenter smoking on television. Um, but anyway, uh, I am here to try, if I can, and it's not easy actually with this picture, so famous. I'm, th I'm going to talk a bit about Jericho's Raft of Medusa, and John is going to talk about what he's done with it. Um, but I thought that maybe for, for those of you here looking at what John's done with it, some sort of jogging of the memory about what it was in the first place might be helpful. And I thought I'd begin, remember the pictures painted um, 1818, 1819. Um, so it's after the great Napoleonic adventure. And I think to set, to set the tone or to, to get you into the mood of where this picture sits in the extraordinary history of French painting, uh, I've chosen an extract. I don't usually read when I talk, but I'm going to read. This is from Alfred de Musset's Confession d'un enfant du siècle, the confession of a child of the century. And I think it exactly captures, and in a quote that I'll give you a bit later on, I think, I think it not only exactly captures the mood that this picture captures, but I think it was influenced by this picture. Uh, it was written afterwards, and de Musset knew Delacroix, and Delacroix is in the picture. Um, so, during the wars of the empire, while the husbands and brothers were in Germany, the anxious mothers brought forth an ardent, pale, nervous generation. Conceived between battles, educated amidst the noise of war, thousands of children looked about them with a somber eye while testing their puny muscles. From time to time, their blood-stained fathers would appear raise them on their gold-laced bosoms and then place them on the ground and remount their horses. The life of Europe was centered in one man. All were trying to fill their lungs with the air which he had breathed. Every year France presented that man with 300,000 of her youth. It was the tax paid to Caesar and without that troop behind him, he could not follow his fortune. It was the escort he needed that he might traverse the world and then perish in a little valley on a deserted island under the weeping willow. Then Napoleon falls. Then the men of the empire had been through so much who had lived in such carnage, kissed their emaciated wives and spoke of their first love. They found themselves old, mutilated, they besought themselves of their sons in order that they might close their eyes in peace. They asked where they were. The children came from the schools and seeing neither sabres nor cuirasses, neither infantry nor cavalry, they asked in turn, where were their fathers? They were told that the war was ended, that Caesar was dead. Then there seated itself on a world in ruins an anxious youth. All the children were drops of burning blood which had inundated the earth. They were born in the bosom of war, for war. For 15 years, they dreamed of the snows of Moscow and the sun of the pyramids. They had not gone beyond their native towns, but they were told that through each gate of these towns lay the road to a capital of Europe. They had in their heads all the world. In their reality, they beheld the earth the sky, the streets and the highways, but all these were empty and the bells of the churches sounded faintly in the distance. So I think, 
Jericho, when he began to paint the raft of the Medusa, Jericho was not quite a child of the century. He's, um, he's an eight-year-old of the century. So he, in his very early career, just about co coincides with the last gasps of this great Napoleonic adventure that de Musset is simultaneously lamenting and uh, criticizing. And uh, Jericho's two major public accomplishments before he set to work on this picture were created during the Napoleonic period, right at the end of it. One of them is called The Charging Chasseur. And it features one of those fathers with their gold laced bosoms charging uh, with his saber raised on a horse, which is, has a tiger skin on it. And there's the smoke of war. It's the sort of picture that Delacroix would become fascinated by. And the second, which, because that picture made people think, oh, here's somebody. And the second picture made them think, oh, this is a bit disappointing. The second picture was this huge painting of a, a fallen soldier, the wounded cuirassier. Um, and he's fallen and he's got his uniform on and he's looking up, but he's hopeless and he's gonna die. And they couldn't understand why an artist would have so broken the rules of a Napoleonic painting. But the truth is that Napoleonic painting had been almost from its inception, a very, very strange affair because it's simultaneously uh, infected by a kind of pessimism born of the experience of war. The artists who painted the pictures, particularly Baron Jean-Antoine Gros, who painted Napoleon's victory, well, Napoleon at the Battle of Eilau and Napoleon at the Battle of Jaffa, See, his job was to paint Napoleon in both cases, who took upon himself all of the old aura and symbolism of, of, of the emperors and kings of the past. In one picture, Napoleon at the plague house at Jaffa, he, he comes like a vision to touch and heal the soldiers who've been stricken with plague during his conquest of Egypt. But Napoleon is tiny. And those suffering from the plague that somebody once worked out, the main plague suffering, were he to stand up, would be nine feet tall to Napoleon's four feet five. So whether those pictures can properly be described as triumphantly declaring the victory of this Napoleonic vision of empire is extremely moot. Um, and, and it, it may be worth mentioning that Baron Gro, who painted those extraordinary divided pictures where you, you can't tell if it's, a, is it a last judgment? Are they, the, are they just the damned or has Napoleon actually saved them? It seems the bodies spill out of the canvas. They, in the Battle of Eilau, the, the frost bitten bodies is what you remember. And all of those pictures hang in the Grand Galleries of the Louvre. They hang in a row. So you can walk in a line and you can walk past one and another and then you come to the, to the Medusa. Um, so this, there's this tradition within Napoleonic painting itself of wondering whether it's all bloody worth it and where are we going? And as my tutor, Anita Bruckner, once pointed out to me, she said, after all, you have to be fairly disenchanted with life to drown yourself as Baron Gros did, Napoleon's great battle painter, you have to be fairly disenchanted with life to drown yourself in a puddle that's only seven inches deep. So Jericho, what else do you perhaps need to know? He's painted these two very ambiguous pictures of um, military failure, but they're painted on the scale of heroic paintings, which is the language of French art. 
and has been since Louis XIV was commissioning Le Brun to paint the great allegories of him as Alexander the Great through to the great paintings of Jacques-Louis David, who you know, was also a painter of, of and for the French king in the Oath of the Horatii and the Brutus painting. These, that, that's the language of French art. And these pictures speak to each other. And there is no doubt that Jericho understands, he knows that what he's doing is he's putting a full stop to that whole tradition. You, ca you can't inhabit that tradition anymore after his picture, at least not with the kind of confidence that you could in the past. He's simultaneously giving it its largest, its grandest, its most universal expression, and he's evacuating it of all the meanings that it was originally designed to possess. So Jericho, two years before he began the picture, he's got this terrible, terrible secret. He's having an affair with his aunt. His aunt is 23. She's older than him, but only just. And his uncle, I think, is 45. He gets her pregnant. He realizes that the denouement is going to come, that the family is going to realize that there's going to be the shame, that what's going to happen, what on earth's going to happen. He goes to Italy. He sets out on a painting, a horse painting, complicated subject, but I won't go into it. But he, what he does in Italy, what does he do? He looks, he goes to Rome. And as so many French artists in Rome, they're not supposed to because he, he's against the canons of academic beauty. They're not supposed to, but they do because all of his pictures are in the French quarter of Rome because he had himself been the painter to the French cardinal. Well, the Cardinal who, of the Medici, who was the fr friend of the French. So all of Caravaggio's paintings are in that part of Rome. So if you're a French artist and you go to Rome, you cannot help getting the Caravaggio COVID. You just get it. And Jericho got it. He, he, he made a very meticulous copy of the entombment by Caravaggio, where this body is being lowered, it's the body of Christ. But it could be one of these bodies. So he made that, and he, and he absorbs Caravaggio's sense of chiaroscuro, his sense of monumentality, his obsessive placement of figures. You know, Caravaggio always, com Caravaggio composed his paintings as if he were sculpting. So he got his figures and he organized them into a mise-en-scene as an, a, a, and the logical thing might have been to turn them into one of those uh, early Northern Italian Lombard terracotta or wooden sculptures in which we see the Mary Magdalene lamenting over the body of the dead Christ. That's what Caravaggio's model is for making art, but he turns it into painting. And Dele uh, Jericho sees that. And when he comes back and he works on this picture, that's exactly the system that he uses. And it's where one of the things that's most uneasy about the final effect of the Raft of the Medusa is the disjunction between the fact that it's set outside and the fact that its lighting is also evidently interior. It's, he's posed these figures and he's painted them one by one on the canvas. It took him a very long time. And each figure has been put. So it's like a kind of collage and, and one of his friends a student of Horace Verne said that he, he went into the studio constantly while Jericho was painting his picture. He said that the picture looks like a wall, a white wall on which fragments of sculpture have been hung. Because sometimes he would go in and Jericho would only have finished the arm of one of the figures. So you'd have this white background because he did all his adjustment of tone and everything afterwards. He painted the figures and then he did all his tone and his landscape. And he never managed to calibrate the landscape 
light with the studio light. So it always looked a bit odd. And I think part of that was that he, he in order to soften that or to, to, to mute it down, he used loads of bitumen, which is a very, very volatile substance favored by Reynolds among others. And it gave you this beautiful glossy black that you could work in and it was very malleable and you could adjust one figure to another, which is exactly what he needed using this strange collage technique. I mean, you know, these are all people that he knew. Who kept, this is Delacroix here. Delacroix came in and studied it, you know, and, 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 and um, modeled for that figure, had to lie like that and came back two days later to see what, you know, how he looked in the painting and wrote in his diary that he was so utterly dis destroyed by the experience of seeing the picture that he had to run all the way home, otherwise he was going to explode. Um, so he did all that. But he decided, so he came back from Rome. When he came back from Rome, Alexandrine Modeste, his aunt, there was, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was about three months before she was going to give birth. So he knew that there was really very little time before he was going to be disgraced within his family. And, and the imminence of this total trauma you know, the, the, the revelation that he'd cuckolded his uncle, you know, just, you can't imagine it. And he was from this very, very straight family and his father's very straight Norman. And, and they're, 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 they're not aristocratic, but they're rich, you know. This is a very, very high born family living in a dandified Paris. And it's just, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So, <sighs> Lawrence Eitner, who wrote a very good book about Jericho, is the, the only major book on Jericho, which is shameful since, since 1879. He said that, um, in his opinion, it, it was the knowledge of that imminence, of, of, of that disgrace coming, that impelled Jericho. He came back to Paris. He moved into the Rue des Martyrs, which, is a, which was a sort of hotbed in Montmartre of liberal um, anti-Bourbon anti, uh, sentiments, you know, a place where liberal art, Horace Vernet was his neighbor, kind of famous liberal um, artist and, and, and sort of polemicist. And, um, you know, the whole area was populated by uh, veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, these sort of the, the, the men who had survived with only one arm or one leg and who were increasingly disgusted by the Bourbon France that had succeeded Wellington's victory at Waterloo and so on. So he's moved into this liberal area and he's exposing himself to these ideas and he's exposing himself to these artists. And then he takes on this massive project. He decides he's gonna paint an absolutely enormous picture. John's picture is to scale. So it, it, you know, this is the same size as the thing itself. So Lawrence thinks that this is, or thought that this, the reason for this is that, you know, he's burying himself in work because he knows that the world is about to explode on his head because of what he's done with his aunt. Um, so he decides he's going to choose a great subject, but he's, he can't settle on what it's going to be. Initially, because I, I think, again, because of the people he's mixing with, the idea is it's going to be quite political and it's probably going to be of a liberal political dimension all his friends are of that ilk um although i should add that when he completed the raft of the medusa he was disgusted by the idea that anybody should impute to it a political point of view he, he, he by by the time he made it he transcended any possible political ambition it seems that he might have had when trying to choose the subject but he did initially choose a number of subjects which indicate that his politics were you know more not Bonapartist, but more liberal um, and anti-Bourbon. So, uh, basically, he, he came across this story, as it happens, in the area that he was living in, the Rue des Martyrs, Carriar and Savigny, who were two survivors of a terrible disaster that had happened two years earlier, a shipwreck. They had been through various wrangles with the French government about trying to get compensation for the fact that they'd been exposed to these terrible dangers and all this crap that had happened to them during a shipwreck. 
And they got fed up and they published a book about it. They published a book about the shipwreck of the Medusa. And Jericho, who'd been casting around for a subject, thought, wow, this is it. I've got my subject. So I thought it might be interesting for you to know what the story actually was. Um, and because it's a bit detailed, I've had to make notes, which I don't normally do. Yeah, so in July 1816, a government frigate called La Meduse, carrying soldiers and settlers to French Senegal, grounded in some reefs in fine weather due to the incompetence of the ship's captain, who had been nepotistically appointed, not for skill, but for his aristocratic connections by the Ministry of the Navy. The ship had 400 people on it, but it only had six lifeboats. And the six lifeboats could only contain 250 people. So the ship was grounded on this reef for like two days before the weather began to get so bad that they realized they were gonna to have to abandon ship. And during those two days, this inefficient, incompetent captain instructed the ship's carpenters to take some of the masts down and make a raft from them. And they made a large raft, which was capable of accommodating 150 people. Then the night before they were going to abandon ship officially, the, sh the captain buggered off on the six rafts with 250 of the higher, everyone who was higher ranking, leaving one woman and 149 black settlers, soldiers of the lower rank and others, including Corriar, the ship's surgeon and Savigny, the ship's navigator, to fend for themselves. 150 people got on that raft. Originally, when the raft had been made, uh, the agreement had been that whoever went on the raft would be towed by the lifeboats because shore was actually not far away. It was visible from the reef on which they were wrecked, but nonetheless, the captain buggered off. So they were okay for a day on the raft and then the waves rose and it was very cramped and they were up to their waists in water. So you had to stay awake, not to drown. And 20 of them got their legs trapped in the interstices of the raft, which hadn't been that well made. So they got drawn down and they died. The next day, civil war broke out because a load of the lower ranking soldiers managed to get hold of all the wine and the brandy and they got pissed. So they had a massive battle on the raft and 65 more people died. On day four, they started eating the bodies of the dead people. And by day six, there were 50 people left on the raft, but only 15 decided that they had a chance of surviving, so they threw the other 45 into the sea. On day seven, they saw a ship's sail in the distance. It was the frigate Argos, which had been one of the other boats in the convoy going to Senegal, but it didn't see them, so it went away. But then it came back the next day and they were saved. So this was the story. Um, and Jericho, as part of his working procedure, uh, he, he made numerous sketches, uh, preparatory paintings, studies, drawings, I don't know if he made maquettes. I wouldn't be surprised if he made some maquettes. And he just couldn't decide which bit to paint. He never seems to have wanted to paint. The part of the book that, that, were, you know, that gets the most words is, is, is why on earth did the captain just bugger off in the night and abandon everybody in this night scene of nocturnal treachery? But Jericho never considered painting that. But he did consider painting the scene of cannibalism. And he did consider quite seriously painting the scene in which they were finally rescued and their exhausted bodies are put onto the, are put onto the lifeboats. But in the end, he didn't. 
he chose to paint this. And as he got closer and closer and closer to painting it, he revised his canvas. He revised it and revised it and revised it. But the revisions always tended in two directions. They always made the horizon seem further away. They always made the wave seem bigger. And they always made the figures seem to tumble more and more into the room where the painting hangs. Other tendencies within it that one could say are an evident desire as he went along to make it less and less circumstantial, anecdotal, and more and more universal and existential. So in a sense, it became less like the events that were described in the book and more like a scene of universal human desperation and searching for something. But remember that in Jericho's mind, the subject he's chosen is the moment when they sight the sail and they climb in the book, it's described that they climb up the wine barrels that were the cause of the mutiny in the first place. They climb up the barrels. So you get this pyramid of straining forms. So once he's decided that this is what he's gonna paint and he's made his canvas big enough and he's, he's bought it and everything, that's when Alexandrine Modeste gives birth to their child. And that's when he is completely rejected by his family. And she is sent away, never to return to Paris. She's sent away to a remote house owned by the family in the country and kept in effect a kind of private prisoner. And the child, who lives, in fact, to be 68, um, is removed and placed under adoption. And at that moment, when the child of the woman he loved, and he did love her because he wrote letters about it. At that moment, when the child, his child is taken, he begins to give birth to the picture. At that moment, that's when he starts, literally like three days later, he starts the picture. And it takes him a very long time to paint it. Um, and the question remains of what it is. And it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, in my opinion, It's quite a fatalistic picture that Jericho himself said in a letter written at around this time, probably thinking about his uh, aunt and their child. He said to his friend, uh, what else is there but pain and suffering? What else do we really, what else can we really count on? He says something like that. So that would be, uh, one personal way of looking at it. If you, I think it's very hard to see it. For me, it's very difficult to see it as some kind of political statement. Um, with the exception, well, I can see it very, as I think Alfred de Musset saw it. Um, I perhaps should read you something else from his commentary which isn't a commentary on this picture at all. It's, it, it's an essay about the nature of what it is to be a child of, you know, to live in the aftermath of Napoleon. But he said, yes, this is, this is, yeah. Three elements entered into the life. It's the language which I find interesting here. Three elements entered into the life which offered itself to these children. Behind them, a past forever destroyed, moving uneasily on its ruins, 
with all the fossils of centuries of absolutism. Before them, the aurora of an immense horizon, the first gleams of the future. And between these two worlds, something like the ocean which separates the old world from young America, something vague and floating, a troubled sea filled with wreckage, traversed from time to time by some distant sail. The present, in a word, which separates the past from the future, which is neither the one nor the other, which resembles both, and where one cannot know whether at each step one is treading on a seed or a piece of rubbish. It was in this chaos that their choice must be made. So I think, you know, I can, I feel it, and I feel that that's what Delacroix saw in it when he painted the bark of Charon and, you know, his other pictures about being shipwrecked or even um, that wonderful painting in saint Peace of um, the wrestle of Jacob with the angel. But I, I, what's, because what this is really, I mean, it is, in that sense of being a reflection on how empty the world is after Napoleon, who's drawn all the air out of it. This picture, that, that's, that really is what it is. It's, it's one of Baron Gros' paintings, but there is nothing except the dead and the dying and the desperate. There is no apotheosis. There's no Napoleon being beamed into the picture to save everybody with the touch of his will. It's as if you've, you've taken half a painting and made it into all the painting. It's a last judgment where there's only the damned. Like, where's the other half? Where's the hope? But on the other hand, maybe there is a bit of hope. Maybe there's a little gleam and maybe there's something. And, and, and if there is a political element to it, I suspect that it's, it's actually the most obvious thing of all which is that the man gesturing at the top, who's one of three black men in the picture, the man gesturing at the top, the man at the apex of the pyramid is black. The, the French revolutionaries had abolished slavery and Napoleon had reintroduced slavery in a very cynical way to bolster the French colonies in the Caribbean and had then equally cynically abolished slavery again in 1815 in order to make peace with the British who didn't like his slavery policies. And even their motives weren't great anyway. But I'm, I feel pretty sure, you know, that, and, and remember that this boat, the Medusa, is going to Senegal. And Senegal is the absolutely central point of transition for all slaves, you know, for hundreds of years. So it, you know, if you're ever going to make a picture that, that has some allusion to all that. So I think if there is a, some kind of feeling of optimism about the painting, it's Jericho's saying, well, we should bloody well, you know, it's all fucked, but at least we're together in this. At least everyone should be together, struggling together, striving together. It, it reminds me also of, um, you know, there's a, often a black man in the adoration of the Magi. Uh, there's a black man who appears in Baroque fountains by Bernini in Rome. It, and, and in that context, a black man symbolizes the fact that the whole world is one world, that we're all together. But I think in Jericho's case, because he was a liberal uh, political man, I think that that's, that is actually quite an important element. I mean, I don't like... Um, making politically correct interpretations of painting for their own sake. But I, I, I think this, this, it is something that was probably quite burningly important for him. It's so noticeable and so prominent. Um, I remember when I made my film all those years ago, my film was about a group of people who called themselves Les Fous de Jericho. And it happened on the recce because I was going to just make a film about the painting. And then I, I recced and I went to see all these people who were going to be interviewees. I suddenly realized that they were all members of the same group. 
and they'd even got a little club and they called themselves Les Fous de Jericho, those of us who are mad about Jericho. There was Denise Aimé Azam, who'd written a biography of him. There was a lovely man who was a mayor in Mortain from Normandy. Uh, there was another mayor from Chénault, which is a town where Alexandrine Modeste lived when Jericho had the affair with her. And there was a political historian. And so we made this film. And so what happened was that the mayor in Chénault, he said, well, you have to remember, Jericho, when he paints his picture, he's in love. He's in love with Alexandrine. He's desperate for his baby. So all of the men on this raft, they are all Jericho. And they are not clamoring for a sale. They are all saying, where is my baby? Where is my love? And Denise Amy Azam, she said, age 93, beautifully lit, she said, Jericho was obsessed with Christianity. He was increasingly becoming a real Christian. And so all of these men on this raft, they are all Jericho the Christian. And he is saying, I need to find God. I need to find God. And the political historian said, well, no, all of these men. Jericho was, he was a liberal, he was, he was really disillusioned with the Bourbon and, and the Napoleon, the war. I mean, these men, they are, they are all saying, where is peace? Where is peace? Where is, where is justice? And I can't remember who the final candidate was. Oh, yes, it was the mayor in Mortain who gave us a massive Norman meal of like astonishing amounts of charcuterie. And then he said, Jericho, he was a normal. It was a normal as a normal they are. We understand food, we understand bread, we understand, we, uh, we are men of sense. Photography is our preferred art form. We like reality. We, he paints the real suffering. So all of these men, this, the whole painting says, this is the real, this is reality. And at the end of which, I, I, I think the end of the film was um, freeze frame on each of these figures. Because I hadn't realized, and I didn't realize it until I finished the film. The mayor at Sheno, guess what his hobby was? He's a romantic novelist on the side, writing French Mills and Boone. The political theorist you already know, Denise Aimé Azam, age 90, guess what she's done? Converted to Christianity. And so on. So I think very, very difficult. I wouldn't like to say. I wouldn't like to say, but I, I, I personally think that Alexandrine Modeste and Lost Love does have something to do with it. Um, but I think that's the, that's the thing about the painting. And he's, he's made it that way as well. He's made it with the gaps, you know, like the people, they fell into the gaps of the raft and they drowned. Well, the painting's like that too. You fall into the gaps. You fall into the gaps and, and you're not sure if, if you're making it mean or if it's, it's making it mean or it's making you mean. But that's what, I think that's what a lot of really great art does. You, you can't say it's about this or it's about that because you don't know. It's different every time you make it. It's different every time you see it. And I suspect that's one of the reasons why John has done what he's done to it. I suspect. And we could look at it now. And of course, it's different for us. I mean, if you watched on the news, if you watched those poor people trying to get here, you know, from there, on their desperate sh little rafts. And then you saw this painting. It's going to speak to you in a different way. It's alive. And we're alive. And it vibrates and it responds and it 
you know, these things happen. And I think it's a challenge as well. It's not just a painting. It's like, well, so what are you going to do? Because you take the painting away with you, you fall into the gaps and so on. Yeah, all that. But once you take it away, hey, do something about it. And that's why it matters. Thank you very much.